Why don't you give the Lord another hand clap of praise if you love him. Amen. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Going to read in verse 1. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and will bless thee, will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Amen. Be turning to Genesis chapter 17. And while you're turning there, I'd like to say that what we just read there in the 12th chapter of Genesis, Brother Jairus Bobby, was the beginning of a covenant between God and Abraham. Amen. And if we just stop right there, Brother Gunn, and read what God had spoke to Abraham, as Abraham was leaving the land of Ur, Chaldee, Amen. God began to tell him some things that he was going to do for him. But how many of you know that a covenant or a contract is a two-sided thing? Somebody say amen. And brother, we just stop right there, Brother Bo, and read what we read in chapter 12. It seemed like this thing was one-sided, now wouldn't it? I mean, God said, I'm going to bless you. And said, people that bless you be blessed. And people that curse should be cursed. I'm just going to pour it out on you, Abraham. Amen. And it seemed like, well, amen, that's the whole thing. But, brother, that was just the beginning. Somebody say amen. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put this in right here. Before you even uh, qualify, amen, to come into a covenant relationship with God, you got to come out from among the world and be separate. Somebody say amen. I wish you'd lift your hand up to God right now and say, Lord, let me fulfill that part of my obligation. I mean, that wasn't even part of the contract, brother. Amen. But you got to leave to even start in uh, to a covenant relationship with God, well, somebody clap your hands if you believe it. Amen. You got to come out from among them and be separate. Amen. Chapter 17 of Genesis. Amen. God's beginning to get into the meat here with Abraham about what this great thing he was going to do was. Amen. Chapter 17, verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. Listen to all these good things God says to Abram. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. Thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, thy seed after thee, and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now stop right there. Brother Gunn, if you're not sharp when you're reading the Scripture there, in the first eight Scriptures, so I just read Amen. It would seem like God again gives a one-sided deal. Somebody say amen. I mean, brother, most of them scriptures, matter of fact, nearly every one of them but one is jam-packed with what God is going to do for this man that was named Abram, uh, who changed his name to Abraham. He said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your seed after you. Uh, amen. Give an eternal promise, amen, to an eternal people. He said, as long as you have a seed, Abraham, uh, they're going to be blessed. I'm going to give them a land to dwell in. Uh, I'm going to bless them coming in and going out, uh, and I'm going to be their God, and they are going to be my people. Uh, but Brother Joey, Amy said, what did Abraham have to do for this? Brother, you go back up to verse 1, Amen, in the last few lines, God told Abraham what he had to do. He said, I am Almighty God. Walk thou before me and be thou perfect. I was somebody lift up your hand and praise him. Come on, brother, listen to me. Amen, back then in that day, if Abraham had to walk before God with an upright heart, Amen, right here in 1991, if you want to be a partaker of the blessings of God, we got to walk with an upright right heart. I dare somebody to clap your hands and shout glory. Amen. Come on, church. You know people sing today, hey, Abraham's blessings are mine. We want to call ourselves the children of Abraham. We'll get up on Sunday school and say, Father Abraham had many sons and I am one of them. But brother, if we're not walking with an upright heart and the Holy Ghost living inside of us. Amen. We're not children of that man. But brother, if we're walking in the truth of God's word with an upright heart and a perfect spirit, we will receive the promise. Won't you give the Lord a hand up a praise if you love him. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's read on. Matter of fact, if you want to, uh, whoever does the tapes, if you want to title this tonight, title it The Mark. Amen. Simply The Mark. I ain't talking about the mark of the beast. You're not talking about something greater than that. Somebody say amen. Chapter, verse 9 of the same chapter. God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man shout among you, shall be circumcised. Listen to this next verse. 
Ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And let me stop right here for a second. This verse I just read to you, verse 11. Matter of fact, some time ago, toward the end of last year, God began to deal with me about this specific verse I just read to you, and most specifically about that word token. And Brother Gunn, I've prayed about it and sought God and said, Lord, what you trying to show me out of this thing? I just felt like, just keep it pondering in my heart, Brother Money and God, but add to it later. And then I'm going to get and tell you how God gave me this message in a minute. But I looked up that word token, and it meant a mark or evidence. How many got the evidence tonight? Amen. Let me read on verse 12. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man, child in your generations. He that is born in thy house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised or he must receive this mark uh, that signifies his covenant. Somebody say amen. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin and who is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off. Now you think about that. What's the importance of this Old Testament marker, this Old Testament sign, amen, of entering into a promise with God? Amen. How important is it? It's so important that God said that I'll destroy the soul or cut off the soul that does not receive this mark. Then, brother, in this new covenant age, amen, how much more important is it, amen, to be marked by his presence? Somebody say amen. He shall be cut off from his people, for he hath broken my covenant. Amen. Now, as I said a while ago, the Lord was dealing with me about verse 11, and we'll read it again in a second. Matter of fact, let's read it now. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. It shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And as I said, that word token meant marker, evidence. It's going to be the evidence. And Brother Gunn, here some time ago around the month of February. Amen. As I said, God had dealt with me toward the end of last year, praying about this scripture. Amen. Looking, Brother Randy, for God to show me something. And I was preaching a meeting out in Little Rock, Arkansas. Amen. As I got out there, amen, to this pastor's house, we'd come in and put our stuff up. You know how you do, you that have been on the road preaching. And I come out there, and Brother Johnson is the brother I preach for. He's got a little library there, Brother Gunn, of some books. Amen. And I've seen a little old book. I mean, it wasn't hardly bigger than nothing, almost a pamphlet, really. Amen. Just a few chapters in the name of that book. Matter of fact, Brother Jerry sung about tonight was the blood covenant. I said, well, this sounds mighty interesting. I pulled that little thing that was written by E.W. Kenyon. How many ever heard of him? I mean, Kenyon, great writer and different things. And I pulled that little thing out and began to look at it. And, Brother Money, what I read in that book, Brother, began to turn something over in my soul. Somebody say amen. And God began to put two and two together inside of my heart. Amen. That's what you're going to hear tonight. Somebody say amen. And, Brother Randy, I began to see how that Kenyon began to write about the very word covenant that I just read several times in this chapter here, the word covenant, covenant, covenant. Amen. God making a covenant. Amen. And like I said a while ago, most of our knowledge of the word covenant is it's a contract during agreement. But Brother Strickland, when I began to read that first couple, two or three chapters uh, of that little booklet, uh, amen, I found out something great about what a covenant is. Somebody say amen. Uh, amen. I began to read what Kenyon wrote there. Uh, and Brother Gunn, he told the definition, amen, uh, of the direct Hebrew word of the word covenant, and it meant a cutting. Somebody say amen. Uh, it meant a cutting, brother. It meant something that was marked or sealed, uh, amen, with a shedding of blood. Uh, oh, somebody raise up your hand uh, and magnify the risen Christ. Uh, amen. Come on, brother. It couldn't have been any other way that that day, it couldn't have been just a handshake. Amen. You couldn't spit in your palm and shake one another's hand. But God said it had to be signified by a mark that was a cutting mark and the shedding of blood. Well, somebody lift your hand up and say, God, no matter what the price, let me take the mark of God's presence in my soul. Amen. Now listen to this. Can you begin to write, Brother Gunn? Amen. About how all through history and all through time, amen, not just among heathen tribes, but even in Israel, Israeli times, back in the Bible days, in the Old Testament era, how several times men, amen, would make a cutting mark, you know, like blood brotherhood. Now you think about that. Have you ever seen in these Western and stuff when you was a kid? Amen. How people would enter in, amen, to a blood relationship. Amen. A cowboy and an Indian would befriend one another. Amen. And when they wanted to keep peace between one another, they promised, I'll be good to you. You'll be good to me. Amen. They cut the thumb or their hand or their wrist or whatever, and they would tie it together and their bloods would mingle. And most of the time we think about that, we think about Indians and cowboys and things like that. But did you know, matter of fact, you sang about it. Did you know that Jonathan and David entered into that kind of relationship? 
Come on, church, listen to that. Why? Amen. Why you say that's crazy, Brother Joy? Why would a man put marks in his own flesh? Because, brother, that left an identification or a token uh, that somebody had entered into something uh, they were serious about. Somebody raise up your hand and pray. I don't know about you. Uh, I took some marks, Brother Gunn. I know you have. Uh, all you different brethren, uh, especially those that have lived down through many years, uh, you've took marks, you've took stripes. Uh, amen. No matter, no wonder Paul could say this. Uh, I bear in my body, amen, the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. I'm colorblind, brother. See it? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Got a low battery. I'm old-fashioned anyhow. I can preach with the core. I'm like Brother Strickland. Sometimes I reach for that thing. Somebody saying, man. Matter of fact, this sounds a little better, don't it? Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Amen. So we get an idea in our minds a lot of times how it's a, a heathenistic thing to do. See, but this is something serious that men enter into, amen, and it's signified. Now, I'm going to tell you some different things about before we get on into the meat of this message about different ways of, of signifying a covenant by the shedding of blood. Amen. Read in that thing some historical facts, Brother Ed, that many times men, when they would enter into a relationship like that, Brother Money, they would split their hand open. The two parties involved. They would let their bloods mingle together and said, Brother Jerry Spivey, that sometime they would, to show such an intimate seriousness about it, they would put their tongues in one another's wounds. That grows some of you out, don't it? Amen. Amen. See, but showing a seriousness there. Amen. And said, Brother Bo, after they would do that thing right there, it would take black gunpowder and pour it into them open wounds. Amen. So that when both of them men's scars healed over in the palm of their hand, there would be a long, ugly black scar in the middle of their hand. And you say, well, Brother Joe, what would the purpose of that be? Brother Gunn, if I come in here tonight with a long, black, ugly scar in my hand, I guarantee you the next time you saw a man with one of them scars, your mind would automatically identify them that man with me. Somebody say amen. I don't know about you, brother, but when you get inside your life, this mark I'm preaching about tonight, you won't be identified with the world anymore. You won't be identified with flesh anymore. You won't be identified with religion anymore. But brother, you'll be identified with the resurrected Christ. I dare you to put your hands together in Jesus' name and clap it for him. Amen. Come on, church. Listen to me. Amen. God's got a people. They don't want to be identified with just flesh anymore. I mean, for too long, we've been I'm talking about people that are serious, like me and you, people that live right, amen, people that are holy. We've been identified, amen, with the junk. It's time that we rise up and begin to be identified with Jesus. Oh, somebody clap your hands and praise God tonight. Oh, come on, clap him to Jesus. Thank God. Amen. Let me tell you something, brother. Amen. This folks, amen, for so long, we've built up religion. We've been identified with the nominal realms. We've, matter of fact, listen to this. We've been identified with hypocrites. Amen, so I can run with this one. We've been identified with hypocrites and hypocrisy. And I mean, for too long, we've come up to one another. Somebody asks you what you are. You agree in for me there and say, I'm a Pentecostal. I'm not I'm about ashamed to call myself Pentecostal. Somebody say amen. Matter of fact, we go up and some people are proud. Smile and say, bless God. I'm apostolic. Come on, amen. Now listen to that. You know, and a lot of times they say, well, you know, we're so stereotyped. Amen. And, and if, if they met one apostolic man that's dogmatic, amen, and, and preaches death all the time, you tell somebody that's what you are, they'll say, oh, yeah, he's one of them. Somebody say amen. You say, bless God, I'm Pentecostal.